begin. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my past today, a little bit about uh, the present, a little bit about the future. Um, today, I want you to know my heart for those who haven't really heard it yet about uh, what God has been doing in me over these past 20 years in ministry and where he is taking uh, me as a person and the ministry that he has called me to, to lead. Uh, I think it's very important that you know the heart of a pastor uh, because uh, we have to be unified as a people, as a fellowship. Uh, and, and our ministry is not for everyone. And we want people here that want to embrace this same mission because it is an important mission uh, that needs to be filled in the body of Christ. Uh, there are many churches, many parts to the body of Christ, and we can't all do everything. I wish we could, right? We could all be super good at missions. We could all be super good at giving and, and helping our neighbors, feeding the poor, uh, helping people with exercise classes so that they get healthy. I mean, there's so many different things that you can focus on. I'm not looking at you for a reason. But, okay? but in ministry, we can't focus on so much or we don't accomplish anything. Does that make sense? And so the Lord has a call for me, and I want to share that call with you so that you can embrace it with me. All right. Um, I think many of you already know this, um, but I have not always been the most perfect pastoral candidate. Uh, I am what many would call a rebel. Uh, I would be, uh, if you watch that movie series, I would be the divergent among them. Okay? Uh, have you seen that movie? I have. I love it. So you read the books? Yeah. So I'm divergent. <laughs> okay, I'm supposed to act a certain way and do things and follow and walk this path and don't ask questions. And that is not me at all. Okay? I take my authority from Scripture alone and what the Lord has for me to say. And I, I think one thing that you should always take away is that I never change or adulterate what I feel that God wants me to tell His people. Uh, and that's something that you should be able to count on. Now that means it's going to hurt sometimes. It's going to feel like sandpaper. It's not going to be entertainment, fluffy joyness. Okay? Uh, but it's going to be truth. And that truth, sometimes even if it's discipline, brings fruit of righteousness and peace as we move forward in our lives. Uh, so, but I want you to know, uh, it's nothing new. I've always been a rebel. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I'm not in a denomination right now, because... Uh, I would have had to either step into line and believe what they told me to believe and do what they told me to do, uh, and those things did not match what I was finding in Scripture and was not matching what the Spirit was telling me. Uh, and so I've, I've gone the hard way of going on my own and starting a ministry. Uh, because of this, our family has experienced much pain and much loss as we have done our best to serve God without compromise. Um, I think almost all of you probably know this, but uh, we were pastors in our first church. We were there for three years, and uh, we, were, we fell in love with the community. When we went to Bible college, they didn't tell us, I'm sorry, you can't fall in love with the community because they're going to turn on you and stab you in the back, and you have to be ready for that. And they didn't teach us that. So we fell in love with the community and the people that we were ministering to. And when the time, time came that they turned on us and stabbed us in the back, it destroyed us. Uh, and we weren't, weren't ready for that. And it wasn't the people, it wasn't the people of the city that turned on us and destroyed us. It was the people that were closest to us. It was our church board. It was the denomination of people in the church. Uh, and it was probably one of the hardest times in our lives where we had so many people that we were actively building relationships with going over into their homes and sitting with them and uh, counseling people that were going through uh, horrible times in their marriage. And we were doing so much, and we knew that God wanted us to be there. But we had this group of elder people in a board say that they didn't want us there anymore. And having to watch those families break apart that we were mentoring, uh, and those that were just about to come to church say, wow, that, that, that doesn't look like God, that doesn't look like holiness, and then they didn't come back to church. 
uh, and it was, it was so much brokenness. And it was hard for us to get over that. And for me, I didn't want to go back and do that same thing again. Uh, if you don't change things, things just keep on happening. And so we said, I'm not going to invest another three years just for the same thing to take place. Um, so on that day, we lost our house, we lost our jobs, and we lost the majority of our friendships that we had. And we lost our identity, our spiritual identity, because we were in a certain denomination for our whole lives. And from that point, we were no longer in that denomination. And so uh, we spent the next year at square one in the attic of our family's, our parents' house. Uh, and it's, it's nothing that I would ask of anyone uh, because, yeah, it was such a setback. Uh, but God uses the things that, <clears throat> that are, are done to us to shape who we are and to shape our calls. Uh, and that is what he has done through us. And so don't mourn for us, be happy for us. And now we're, you know, getting to the point where we're happier now and we've been healed from those things. Uh, and God is using us now to do ministry to help those who are going through some of the same things. Uh, God does some amazing things when people are fully surrendered to his will. And so um, you can play Christianity for a long time. I don't know if you know this, but you can have a bad marriage. You can have a good job. You could... You could be really active in sin and on the surface act really holy. Even pastors can do that from time to time. But when you're fully surrendered to God, when you're really tight with God, some really cool things can take place. And there are seasons that pastors go through, that families go through, where you will enter this time of just super closeness to God. Have, has anyone ever felt that? where there's a period in your life where you were just super tight with God? Yeah, some, some maybe not. Okay. Well, it's amazing. Uh, and I'll give you a hint. Usually he does this right after he destroys you somehow. Okay. And so for us, I knew that our time coming, uh, working in this church was coming to an end. Uh, there was no pride left. Uh, there was no fight left. We were, we were there, and I was broken. Uh, but I was serving, and I was still humble. And there was a, this period of time where I became very close to God, and He led me to the book of Revelation, which is a crazy book, by the way. Uh, but during one of these times of full humility and surrender, as a family was being thrown around, uh, I was close to God, and during this time, he revealed things to me then that have directed my call ever since. Uh, I didn't know that I wasn't going to be a pastor for uh, nine years after that, or but like eight years, uh, something like that. Uh, There's a long time from being a pastor. That's my career, to not being a pastor and then being a pastor. Uh, but God has directed us through that time, and so we're, we're going to be sharing some of those things. Today I want to share those things with you so you can decide if you're willing to embrace these things that I have embraced. For every action we take in this ministry is directed by the call of God that he has bestowed on me as an individual. Uh, and that's the cool way that we're set up here. There's nothing that holds you here. Uh, there is no membership. Uh, if you're here, it means that you're here to learn about God, uh, to be a part of the fellowship. Um, but there's no, the way that we're set up is there's, there's no way that someone can come in and cause the division that I see in many churches. Because the church stops at the pulpit. Everyone else is built on relationships. That's it. Uh, and so if your relationship starts to go a different way or you start to want a different thing, we're not going to hate you. We're going to say, in love, let's help you find another place to serve God. Amen? But hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully if you're here, uh, maybe God has brought you here for a reason. Maybe to join the mission that we have so that together we can really be an important part of growing God's kingdom. Join into it. We can grow. 
I'm not Darth Vader. <laughs> okay? Alright. And it's much deeper. Join me. Okay? <laughs> Okay, uh, so if we are united in calling, God will do things through his people. And so that's my purpose, is I want to be able to share with you what my heart is uh, that God has, has put there uh, to see if you can join me in that. Because if we can work together with one purpose and in one mission, God is going to do some great things. And that's uh, through anything that, that we do as Christians. So let's, I'm um, going to have four scriptures here, and I'm going to read through them, and then we're going to get uh, into um, looking at the scriptures more deeply. Uh, so this is Revelation chapter 14, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, and, and feel free to take notes. Uh, this is uh, a sermon that, or a teaching, that will help you know what my heart is. And so when we make an action in the future, a decision in the future, it is because of what's happening today that I'm sharing. So this is Revelation chapter 14. And this is 6 through 8. So yes, I had uh, <clears throat> a wonderful experience reading through the book of Revelation. And uh, there are times when you read scriptures and it, it seems like there's a veil over your face and over your heart and you read it and you're like what is he trying to say here uh, and you just can't get anything uh, but when I read Revelation in this time of humility it was like God opened my eyes and I, I could just see things uh, and it I wouldn't say that it was prophecy like, thus saith the Lord, but the Lord reveals things to his people, and whatever he has revealed, it's, it's generated this calling that I have, and so I want to share that with you. Uh, and so here are some of the scriptures that, that really helped pinpoint what my call is. Uh, so in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 8, it says this, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, with the eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who has made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of the waters. And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. The next scripture is in Luke chapter 21. And then we're going to be back into Revelation 18. This is Luke chapter 21, 20 through 22. And it says this, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are inside the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are the days of punishment, so that all things which have been written will be fulfilled. Now if you move back to Revelation chapter 18. <clears throat> verse 4 and 5. It says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive any of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her offenses. 
May the Lord bless His Word. All right. So we're going to go back to that first scripture. Um, and I'm just going to kind of open them up a little bit more here. Uh, the angel in this first message, whenever you hear about angels, uh, the, the word angel actually means messenger, someone who is providing a message. And what I, I think has happened is that there are many of us that, that God has called to start sharing this message. In fact, this first message, I think, has been shared uh, for a long time. Uh, and this message is the eternal gospel. It is the warning that the church has been given ever since Christ arose. Uh, and it's the same. It doesn't change. The message is fear God and give Him glory. And basically, when we boil that down, it's just talking about personal holiness. It's make way this, make straight the way for the Lord. It's get right with God. It's don't be, uh, you need to follow His commandments. It's called be holy because I am holy. And, and so many pastors from many churches have said this ever since Christ passed away and, and rose again. Uh, but it's very important. The three angels' messages are like a truck shifting gears. And this is the first angel's message. And this is, like I said, the message that has been shared throughout Christianity. Same message. Very, it's basically the gospel summed up in Emmanuel, God with us. Okay, it's, it's about holiness. Okay, uh, so the message has been building ever since pro Pentecost. Uh, but there's also a warning. And the early church had this warning, and then we kind of lost, you know, after 50, 60 years, we just kind of lost that warning. Um, how many of us today woke up thinking that God could really return today, that Jesus might be coming back today? Okay, some of us maybe. I honestly didn't. I woke up today, and I was planning my next week already. Right? But the early church, and what this is warning us about, is that we need to be prepared at all times for Christ to come back. It says that he's going to come back as a thief in the night. He's not going to give warning. But we don't live like that. And that's what this message is, this first angel's message is, fear God, give him glory. The way that we give him glory is through our worship. And the way we worship him is through what we do, our actions of sacrifice and obedience. The way that we love people is our spiritual act of worship. All right. Uh, but the warning is here. Judgment is coming. Make your ways straight. Uh, and so that's the first angel's message. The second message, an angel's message is kind of where, the, where my call is. And it says, and another angel, a second one, Followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. All right, so I'm going to leave this slide up here. There's a lot on here. The second angel's message is the one uh, that is on the cusp of being fulfilled. And that is what I feel the Lord has revealed to me. Uh, Babylon is about to fall. Or is in the process of falling. The Spirit of God is preparing many people with the same message. Uh, if you get on YouTube, if you get on anywhere, you will find people that are starting to talk about this fall. Uh, but we really need to define what is Babylon the Great. Uh, and so for what you need to know, and what I fully believe is that Babylon the Great has become the organized church. That is the religion of Christianity. And so there's nothing fun to talk about that. Uh, but that is what I believe that Jesus has revealed to me uh, as the only thing that it could be. Uh, when you go back and you look at Revelation, I think it must be 19 or so. You can flip there for a second if you want. No, it's uh, 18. 
after it says, come out of her, my people, there are certain things that are identified in chapter 18 that can only represent Christians. That can only represent the church. And so we have to understand this. Uh, so in, in 18.4 it says, Come out of her, my people, that you will not share in her sins. Saying, come out of the church. But how do we know? Uh, let's see, in, in the middle of verse 7, it says, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. And here the theology about this marriage, this marriage is talking about the marriage to the Christ, the bride and the bridegroom. And what this Babylon the Great is saying is that I sit as a queen, I am not a widow. So the, the, the thing that, that, that Babylon the Great is, is something that truly believes they are part of this marriage party. Does that make sense? And it says, and I will never mourn no more. Okay? Uh, let's see. What's another one here? Uh, verse 21. <clears throat> It says, then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea. Whenever you see the term millstone, it is always referring to the church in every instance. It's referring to someone who knows about God and has chosen to mess up someone else's faith. Does that make sense? Uh, and that's why it says if you're a Christian and you cause a little one to stumble, if you cause a child to stumble as a Christian, what is the penalty for that? It is a, a millstone. It, it said it would be better if a millstone was tied around your neck and you were dropped into the sea. And so here we have two things that are identifying uh, things that only happen in the bride of Christ. All right, uh, 22, it says, the, the music of the harpists and the musicians uh, will not be heard in you again. Uh, the workmen won't be heard of it or trade in you again. Uh, and then 23 is a big one. It says, the light of a lamp will never shine in you again. And the, the way that it's... it's it's, it's portrayed here is that it was shining at one time, but it will never shine in you again. And we know that the light is talking about the bride. It's, about, it's talking about the light of Christ. And then if that didn't get you, verse, uh, later on in verse 23, it says, the voice of the bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. And that's sad. It's not talking about a certain religious organization or a country or a state of something. There's only one thing that God revealed to me that could really fit what this is talking about. And to me, it is the religion of Christianity. Not the fellowship. And there's people in every church that are part of the fellowship of God, that are doing their best to obey the Lord. Amen? Amen. And not every church and every denomination is part of this. They have good hearts and they're following the Lord. There's good churches in our community still. But there is coming a time that the church is going to fall. And that is what the Lord has revealed to me. Uh, so one on here is the organized church is about to fall and be destroyed. I don't know how long that's going to take. And it hasn't fallen completely yet. But that's what the Lord has revealed to me. 
Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I believe that God has revealed this truth to me. In my opinion, the homosexual pastor has become the abomination of desolation that has triggered this punishment. Uh, never before in Christianity has any church body where the top people in the church have changed and over, overturned what God has deemed as sin and said that it is no longer a sin. It has never happened in church history. And the scriptures say that before the tribulation starts, an abomination of desolation has to be set up inside the sanctuary, inside the temple. And for us, we are the temple. And for uh, almost half of pastors in this world are now beginning to believe that homosexual, a homosexual practicing pastor can be holy and teach about God's holiness. That is, for me, what God has revealed as the abomination of desolation. One of the signs that God gave me for this is that there was a man who decided to come to our church who uh, we love very much. And his name was Darwin. And he was in the ECLA and they were one of the first denominations to formally vote and accept homosexuality as holy. And he had been fighting for 20 years on his church board to fight against that vote. And he, on that day, he came into our church and he was broken and he was defeated because he had spent his whole life trying to fight for Christ, only at the end to be thrown out and to feel worthless and like he failed. And we love that man. And he helped us in ministry a lot. He was a bright spot. And he came to our church because that week I preached against homosexuality. And I taught about it. I taught about the truth. And he came... And then he started to have cancer, throat cancer. And he had cancer pretty bad. He was in stage three or four. And he hadn't come to church in a while. And so I kept talking to him, and I got him to come to church so that we could just pray for him, because we just missed him. And if he was going to die, we just wanted to see him a little bit before he died. So he came to church that day. And at the end of our service, we just started to pray for him. He came up, we anointed him with oil, and we just started to pray. And it wasn't, I mean, some prayers are kind of dorky. Like today I've had some dorky prayers. I'm like, oh, whatever. <laughs> but when we prayed then, it was like I wasn't even there. Words were coming out of my mouth that I didn't understand. And we prayed. And we prayed with our hearts. And we prayed as a unified body because we loved that man. And he went home that day. And he called me the very next day, less than 24 hours later. And he said, I just opened a letter from a test that I took the week before. And they said that the cancer was gone. It was just God. God had healed him a week earlier, knowing that in faith we were going to pray for him. <clears throat> and I told him that that was his, that was his gift from God because of the faith that he had, that he got to experience that miracle. I made her cry twice now. All right. But anyway, so moving on.
There was a second sign. The, uh, the same church, the ELSA church. They couldn't just accept homosexuality. They had to do it in their general confidence because they had many people that were against it. So what happened was their general conference was in Minneapolis at the convention center. And this was like 12 years ago. And so they made the announcement for the vote. And everyone was down, uh, all the voters were down there, and they actually opened up the voting to vote on the issue of homosexuality. A few moments later, while the vote was being taken, a storm on a cloudless day, or maybe it wasn't cloudless, but there was no storm, a storm formed directly above the convention center, and you can Google this, I think it's out there still, and a tornado formed and hit the convention center while the vote was taking place. Everyone stopped the vote. They ran for shelter. The tornado only hit the convention center, and then it went away. Now for me, I'd take that as a sign if I was there, amen? <laughs> yeah, right. But sadly, they did not. They reconvened, and they passed it. So for me, that was a second sign. It was a sad day. It was a day that... I think Jesus wanted to mark and say, I do not approve, and I'm going to show you a miracle. And I, I really believe that a miracle happened, that at the moment that they were taking that vote, a tornado came down and only damaged the convention center to get their attention. And it didn't work. And that was sad. <clears throat> so anyway, moving on. God is going to allow this to take place. And we have to understand this. There are many Christians who feel that they're going to remain in their churches and their denominations, that there's going to be a revival, and that there's going to be this great turning back of the sin within the denomination. And the truth is, is I, I, when I look at the scriptures, I see that it has to take place and that it's not going to change. That doesn't mean God can't change it. Uh, I know that God uh, came when he was going to destroy the kingdom of Jerusalem, and there was a good king, and he said, I'm going to wait till you're done. Maybe that happens here. I don't know. Uh, we don't know when it's going to fully fall, uh, but I believe that that's the path that it has to take. God is going to allow it to take place because he's faithful. And he gives us our free choice. And we can choose to follow him. Uh, the, when, <laughs> when they left Egypt, they were faithful for a bit. Do we, do we honestly think that we're better than them or different? No, we're not. We're the same broken people. All right. But even after the fall, and, and I want you to understand this, even after the fall, God will continue to make ways for his people to receive grace. Even if he fully destroys, if he goes in and just tears down every church building, the people that come out of that are still going to have opportunities to receive grace. Because that's what God does. He does this great big punishment, and out of that comes righteousness. And so... These people, even the ones that are pushing these horrible things, they're not our enemies. We still love them and pray for them. And we have to be open that God is going to have mercy on them and that he's going to continue. When I look at Revelation, there's like three different times where it's like, okay, half the world dies. And then he says, and they still did not repent and follow me. He still gives opportunities time and time again as the world is ending to come back to him. And there will be some that do that. Okay? So it's not like we're just cutting out, oh, oh you go to the left of the Methodist church, whoa, oh, oh, stay away. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't, want to, we don't want to do that. Okay? They're not our enemies. But what I'm trying to do is show you what God has shown me 
so that we can help all people that are in the church. Even if it hurts us and we get insulted and abused. All right, uh, so the fall defined. Church organizations will either be fully destroyed and dismantled, like the temple in Jerusalem, or there will be so much sin and compromise in those churches that the Spirit of God will no longer reside in it. And so when we, when we talk about this fall of Babylon, we have to realize that if we're talking about the church, that doesn't mean that every cathedral, every temple uh, is going to just be torn down into nothing. But that does mean that things, uh, things like the government could come in and say, hey, denomination, all your buildings are connected to your one denomination, and we're going to sue you so much that you just have to get rid of all those. So you have no more buildings. We're going to take all the funds away. We're going to take all your pensions away for your pastors. Uh, we're going to do all these things to attack you so much that the church, the thing that you've called church no longer exists. And then for them, they're going to have to figure out what that new identity looks like when they have no buildings and they have no general assembly and they have no church boards because all of that was taken away. And then there's those other churches that I think, I think some of us already know that God is just no longer in them. There may be people in those churches that still have Christ, but the things that they teach are so outside of holiness, it's, it's, it's contorted into this, uh, this love and toleration of sin. And that's not what Christ, Christ has come to destroy that. Why would we want to be part of it? All right, so we move on. So the response, and, and this is where my call starts to come into play, uh, the response. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, then rec recognize their desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are inside the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are the days of punishment, so that all things which have been written about will be fulfilled. The fall of Babylon's been written about. It has to take place. It doesn't matter when, it, when, but it has to take place before Jesus comes back. There is going to be a tribulation. The days of punishment will be fulfilled. The sins of God's people in His church must be accounted for just as the priests in Malachi. Do you remember what happened in Malachi? Malachi is a really small book at the end of the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. They, they stick the fork in the food and take out extra. Okay. Um, <laughs> basically, what happened was God's people kept on be getting more and more and more disobedient. And he would punish them, then they'd get better, then they'd disobey worse, and he'd punish them worse. It was like they were, were going after that cookie, and Mom said no, and they took it. And then they did that like 20 times. Like, no matter what punishment it was, they whoop, oh, I get the cookie again. And, but here in Malachi was the last straw for God. And it was his very own priests, the people that were supposed to be protecting the holiness of God. They decided to sin, and sin on purpose, and call it holy. And... God was silent for 400 years and left their presence. And now we flip back to what we're doing today. We're doing the same thing where the priests, the people that are supposed to tell us and hold uh, the name of God in such high regard that they've squandered it and, and they've changed it and adulterated it. That God is about to do the same thing. I... Uh, in all the scriptures, whenever God comes to judge, He always starts in the temple and He moves out from there. Uh, I forgot where the scripture is, but it talked about where this angel came to punish uh, something that the nation was doing. And they started in the temple and worked out from there. And see, this is where God's judgment on earth, I think, is going to work in the same way. He's going to start in the church and He's going to bring discipline and he is going to 
uh, bring judgment on his church. And then that will work out for the world. The church is about to recognize its desolation. The term desolation means void of presence. What do you think they're talking about when we talk about desolation in the church? What are your thoughts? Desolation in the church. What is void? God's not there. God's not there. Exactly. God is no longer going to be there. And they are going to begin to feel that. The church is about to recognize that it has become void of the Holy Spirit. Now there are many movements that have started to fake the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you know that it's fake because what you'll see is they'll have really long worship services. They're going to have really great music with like the best instrumentalists and they're going to hype you up for 45 minutes get you jumping and all excited and then they're going to raise their hands and they're going to speak in tongues and prophesy and they're going to do all these wonderful things and they're going to say you know what i think there's a, a person named carrie in in the service today and I, I think she's going to get healed of something okay and boom she gets healed because she's she's the only person named carrie and she just feels woo, this is great okay and then other people start prophesying. You, one guy is struggling to get a job, and you go up and you, he said, they say, no, you just go prophesy, say whatever God puts on your heart. And, and you go over and you put your hand on him and you say, the Lord is going to give you a job this week. He has told me. You know, and all these people, and then they say, well, it's okay. You know, as long as 10% of the prophecies are right, you're good. And people feel this power. They're speaking in tongues. They feel like they're filled with the Spirit. And, but you know what happens? Monday night, they feel broken again. They feel empty. They feel the same. And so you know what they do? They go for the Wednesday night fill-up. And they go, ah! What happens Thursday night? They feel the emptiness, the brokenness. And this has been going on. You know the fastest segment of Christianity right now is experiencing this false spirit. And people are leaving that church so fast that they can't count. And the reason is, is because once you do that for four or five years, you realize that it's fake. Eventually, you get to the point where you have cancer and everyone, even the pastor, has healed of you of it a hundred times and you still have cancer and you die and your family, they just, they just leave the faith altogether. Because if I go to a different church, why would that church be any more powerful than the one that was... Don't need all the bells and whistles. That's, that's why we don't have bells and whistles right now. Well, you're talking about a piano. I know. That's, that's, like, <laughs> that's like a string, though. It's not a bell. It's actually a question. It's like a drum. Okay, but we have to realize that there is this false spirit there, and it is very attractive because there's a lot of people that have been void of this power, void of this presence for so long, and it becomes so enticing because they feel good when they walk into the service. And we have to know that it's fake, it's false. It's part of this Antichrist system. If you can't read the Word and be filled with the presence of God, and you need something extra, that's not God. Amen? Amen? And if you feel the glory of the Father on Sunday morning and you don't feel Him anymore Monday afternoon, you didn't have it on Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. All right. I'll stop there for that one. <laughs> Okay, but the church is about to recognize its desolation, okay? And it's because of their unbelief. Do you know how many people go to church on Sunday and live like the world the rest of the week? Even as a pastor, I struggle with that sometimes. We live in such a broken world, and never before has the broken world been able to come into our homes with such ease. Amen? Uh -huh. 
If I want to watch brokenness, I can turn on any magical box in my house. And the world appears. All right, the result of this desolation. Now listen to this. The result of this desolation will be a wave of hungry lovers of God seeking out His presence in the mountains. There will be people from every denomination and every church that will get to the point where God has them leave. Now from the church's standpoint, these people have backslidden and they have gone, they have just away from the faith. But what I'm telling you is that God, the Spirit, is calling these people out because of the compromise and the sin that is in the church. And He is going to call them out so that they can be in a better position when the fall of the church takes place. Because I tell you this, if you grow up your whole entire life with an identity in one specific denomination, and you watch that denomination be totally, utterly destroyed with propaganda from the media and everyone saying how horrible this, this thing was, it is going to be extremely hard for anyone in that position to remain in the faith. But God is giving some of them grace and they are following the Lord's call and coming out of those broken systems. And they are fleeing to the mountains. And my call is for those that are meeting there, if that would make sense. The time is coming for God's to proclaim, let my people go. And he will call them out of these systems. You know that there are Lutherans that be firmly believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that they have to have their children confirmed if they are to go to heaven. There are Catholics that believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that if they are not able to take the Eucharist on Sunday morning from the priest, then they are void of heaven. There are people that believe these things because that is what they have been taught. And it's not true. There are churches that say that you cannot take communion in any other church or you will be judged. I could go on a lot about those things. So for me, I am called to help unite these lovers of God into his spotless bride as we will all be required to shed our former identities of religion and tradition to embrace Christ as our only identity in His holiness. What does that mean? It means that if you are here, uh, like most of you are, the regular attenders, you have already gone through a crucible where you have left the church of your youth, You've left the churches of your past because of pain, because of hurt, uh, because this, they weren't acting like the holiness of God. Uh, many of you have spent years outside of ministry and the church and the fellowship because of those pains and those hurts. And you are here today because of the system that we are creating to reunite you into the fellowship of a living God. Not to put an organization on you or to bind you in any way other than through the relationships of love with each other. Those that come here will come here because I teach the truth to the best of my ability and I don't compromise it. That is the only thing that brings you here outside of the relationships we have to each other. So my unique call And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive any of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her offenses. If I could boil down my unique call into one verse, it would probably be this one. 
And so you can star this verse if you'd like. This is Revelation 18, uh, chapter 4 and 5, or verse 4 and 5. And what you're going to notice as I do ministry, as I prepare the flock that the Lord has given me, is everything that I do will flow out of those verses. Because that has become the core of my call. My call is not to win new Christians. But through my call, I will still win new Christians. Does that make sense? My call is not to baptize people, yet by doing my call, people will still be baptized. But my call is focused into this area. Uh, as the chap, uh, pastor of this fellowship, I need those who are willing to be in leadership. Now, this just isn't everyone. This church will function most days. You won't know any of this stuff's going on because we're going to be in the book of John, right? But the leadership, if you want to be in the lead, if you want to be an elder of this ministry, which is all about relationships, I need those people to fully understand my calling. And not only understand it, but have a deep heart to accomplish it. Does that make sense? Uh, for by myself, I can do nothing. God has called me, but there's only so much I can do. I'm one voice. I only have a certain amount of hours in the day. Okay? But with a body of believers uniting under one purpose, we can do the impossible as the Spirit empowers us to do His will. Amen? All right. So, in its simplest form, I've been called to do many of the things that Moses did for God's chosen people. Now, I'm not calling myself Moses. Okay, like I said before, I believe that there are many pastors all across the world that are all following this same call. Because if God is about to call out his people, how could one pastor do it? It is just being done. There are many pastors that are doing this. But we're unorganized. We don't. We, we feel alone. Uh, for the past 10 years, I felt alone. And I felt like I'm against Goliath. I'm David. And Goliath is there as the organized church. And they're not helping us at all. They don't want to touch us. We're the crazy cult people. Okay? And that's okay. I'm okay being the crazy cult people. Because I firmly believe what I believe. And even if I am the crazy cult people, as long as I'm leading people to obey the word of the Lord, and we're reading the scriptures and obeying it, I don't think God's going to punish us for that. If we're too holy. If we look too much like Him. If we're loving. But here's what it is in the simplest form. I'm called to reveal the slavery of God's people. Uh, when you look at my Facebook posts, uh, when... Uh, some of the sermons that I preach, a lot of the times I'm trying to help people to know the slavery that they're really in. Uh, and it's not for every church. Like I said, there's some healthy churches in this town. I'm not trying to call those people out. But there are some churches in this town that have become antichrist in their beliefs. That doesn't mean all the people are antichrist. And those are the people that I'm, I'm hoping that begin to see the slavery that they're in. You know, there's a, the trick that I think Satan is using right now, that there's this pride and arrogance that people can save their church. And yes, it's not above a miracle of God to do so, but all throughout history, when, leaven, when too much leaven gets into the bread, what happens? You can't take it out. Right. And these organizations, these denominations and these churches have allowed so much leaven to get into the bread that there is literally, outside of a, a miracle of God, there's no way to, to, to clean it. Do you think all those people that are in positions of leadership now are just all of a sudden going to say, you know what, we were wrong about homosexuality. Let's, let's change our mind. It's not going to happen. And so we have to be careful with that. So my job is to first call people, remind them they're in slavery. 
There's so many people that think they're part of really great churches. And I, I'm not going to point out any specific churches. I don't want to get in trouble. All right, but we're going to move on. Secondly, I'm proclaim, called to proclaim God's message to the slave masters. Let my people go. And I would tell you that there are many pastors, probably in this town, that hate my guts. Okay? Because I am actively going after their people. This is going to be on Facebook. I'm actively coming after your people. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> because you're not a good shepherd anymore. Repent. And then I won't come after your people. <laughs> okay? Is it wrong to go after people in a dying church that might be going to hell? Why are we so politically correct that I can't try and show those people the error that their teachers are sharing? But in doing so, I will not be popular. We will be the cult in town. What do you got? What did Jesus say to the disciples when the disciples asked him that the church is not teaching the people properly? What do you do? And Jesus told the disciples, you treat it like a tree that is that has beautiful leaves, but it's producing rotten fruit, you said you cut it down and throw it in the fire. Cut it down and throw it in the fire. That's right. And I firmly believe that Jesus is going to be tossing some tables around here. <laughs> and I think he already is. Uh, did you know uh, Barna, which is the, the research division for Christianity, they do all this great research, and they, they're right almost all the time. They came out with a study this year that talked about the effect of COVID that has had on the church. And what they said was that one third of the church walked away and is no longer attends church in 2020. A third of the church. That is a serious blow. I mean, that's huge. That's an entire generation that walked out of the church because the older ones are still there. And that's why the fall of the church is coming. And I want you to understand why it is coming so that you can have a heart for it, a compassion, a yearning to help our relatives, to help our neighbors, to help our friends, to be able to understand what's going to be taking place so that we can help them transition as God calls them to flee to the mountains. And we're not called to set up a new denomination. We're not called to set up a new organization. We're called to allow God to be our provision, and for Him to be our teacher, and for the Spirit to give gifts to the different people, and for the Spirit to work through them in one fellowship. It's not about power. It's not about control. It's not about some people making thousands of dollars every year and some people only have to give thousands of dollars every year. It's not about that. It's about being the body of Christ. No red tape. When God calls you to do something, we're going to come around you and we're going to help you accomplish the call that God has placed on your heart. And we're not going to bind ourselves with buildings and and all these things that all this money and this effort has to go into. So when the church starts to shrink, the, the building becomes a, a tomb. And no ministry can be done. Because we have to keep washing the tomb and painting the tomb. And making sure oh, there's heat in the tomb. Number three. I'm called to empower people to understand that it is God's will for them to flee to the mountains. People need to know that it is okay because it is the hardest thing that every single person will ever do as a Christian. Because when you are born, you are born into a system. They like the Matrix. Great example. It's everything that you know. And I'm asking people to take the blue pill, which sounds very cultish, and I'm telling you, hey, take this blue pill, and we're going to reveal what's really going on. You're going to see the sin in your church, and we're going to call you out of that, and it's okay. God's not going to punish you for leaving your church. 
God's not going to punish you because you feel like you have to tithe all this money to this organization and now you, you, you're not. And the devil's going to use that and he's going to try and trick you and, and he's going to make you feel like you're broken and, you're, and, and there's something wrong with you and he's going to try and put shame on you. But my call is to help you know that that's what the Lord is calling us to do. Not to stop ministering, but to minister in his fellowship and his fellowship is being called out it's not good news but it's his news all right and fourth i'm called to reestablish the bride that has fled to help prepare the spotless bride for his return when i left our denominational system it probably took a good five years to heal from the pain, uh, deal with all the emotions that went along with that decision. Because that was our identity. Those were our, that was our family. And what we need to do is have pastors like me who have already gone through that and can create systems where we can fellowship where it's based on relationship and not an organization so that it takes less time because the time is near. We don't know when God comes back. We can't afford pastors that are fiery for God who are getting kicked out of their churches and they're burned out and they're alone. We can't wait five years for them to start following their calls. We need to be able to love them and come around them and show them that it's okay, that God's pulled them out and that they can continue preaching the very next day and that we're going to help them do that. And we're going to show them how they can do that without having approval from a general assembly and a district superintendent to say, oh, we're going to allow you to be a pastor. Amen? Amen. And so that's what my call is. So in our church here, this church is a prototype of what we want to build a system for other pastors and other churches to take on as they come out of this established church. And uh, write, I'm writing a book about it, and I can't just publish a book because we're still doing it. And so as we go, as we keep uh, moving forward, as we grow our vision, as we plant other ministries and birth other churches, uh, all that is going to be going into knowledge to give to other pastors so that they can do the same things. Uh, the Methodist Church right now is about to uh, embrace homosexuality, and there are probably only about, we'll say, 25 pastors in all of Minnesota, maybe 30, that still believe that homosexuality is wrong. And those pastors are going to be called out of their denominations, and they're going to be scared. And they're either going to have to form another denomination with other people that have come out, or there's a better option. See, because they're going to form another denomination and they're just going to run into the same problems in a couple years. Because America is no longer a Christian nation. I don't know if you know that or not. We have to stop calling it that. America's changed. And we don't have the same helps that we had. We're going to be facing persecution in the coming years. Within five years, we might be facing extreme persecution. Like open-faced persecution for those that are truly following the Lord. They're not going to persecute the ones that are tolerant and accepting of everything. They're going to come after the ones that claim a holiness and claim other things as sin. All right, so that is my call. And so I wanted to wrap it up uh, by, oh, well, kind of, kind of telling you where we're going in 2021. Okay, so this is my plan for 2021. Uh, 2020, we, God gave us the green light to actually start ministry. I remember sitting with Pastor Will at a family camp, and I was in tears, and we were weeping together. It wasn't a family camp, it was a men's retreat. And he had everyone from the church, all the guys that were there came and prayed for me. And I said, I just want to preach. I want to teach, because that's my call. And it was that kind of, at that time, that I think everyone kind of gave me the green light. I said, go ahead, go do it. Uh, <laughs> crazy things happened after that. But anyway, so then uh, we've started our ministry. 
we I did all the research. I wrote a, a, a book that I haven't published yet. And uh, God helped me write that book in 15 days. I wrote a whole book. Uh, and it almost felt, I remember it, because it was last January, and it almost felt like God was writing the book through me. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I was writing, but it was like new thought, right on paper, new thought, right on paper. And it flowed so smoothly, uh, it just came out. And it was this type of system that we're doing now. Uh, and so then we started to organize. And right when the pandemic hit, we had our first official church meeting. And uh, it was the first mass mandate. And everyone was scared and everyone was going to try and get COVID. And so it was a crazy time, right? Uh, and so then we've grown slowly ever since. We haven't had bells and whistles. We've had uh, deep theological discussions in the Word. Uh, and I think a lot of people have grown a lot in their faith through those. Uh, and then recently we've moved here. Uh, and taken on about three or four new families. And so we're, we're finally getting to the point where it, it really is starting to feel like an actual ministry, a, a, a flowing kind of church that can uh, not just be inward focused, but we're getting to the point where we're going to get large enough where we're actually going to be able to start doing some ministry as a body. Does that make sense? Because uh, we don't have any programs right now. We don't have any youth programs, nothing like that. I hate the word programs, but you know what I mean. Okay, so uh, phase one. Uh, we're still in this phase. Uh, this is preparing our hearts for service. Discipleship. We're reading the Word and allowing the Spirit of God to transform our hearts. Uh, this is a continuous thing that we will always do, but there will be a time when we become prepared. Uh, and I can see that in your hearts. I'll be able to know when... You've taken on so much scripture that you're getting to the point where you're like, okay, I know what I want to do. I want to go do something for the Lord. Okay, and that time just, just happens. Okay, it's a joyful time. And that's where phase two comes in. And so phase two, uh, we're going to start seeking individuals' calls for services. And this is children and teens too. Uh, if you're a, a teen, a, a child, it doesn't mean that you don't have a call that God's given you. We're going to help you find that. I don't care if it's selling lemonade on the street and just uh, giving people a Jesus loves you pamphlet for every receipt that you, you give out. You know, whatever it is. Okay? Uh, but the Holy Spirit has a plan for each one of us, and He has given us all different gifts. Uh, do you know that? That the Holy Spirit has given you unique and special gifts to praise Him and to give glory to Him. And so once we find those things, We'll begin to help empower each person to minister in those gifts. And that's why we can call them, you know, some people may call them programs like a children's ministry or a teen ministry or a, a men's ministry. Okay, But in reality, we're going to wait on God to be our provision. And he's going to come to you and he's going to say, I'm going to lay these teenagers on your heart and I want you to help these teenagers. And then you're going to come to me and you're going to say, you know what, I really think the Lord is kind of putting teenagers on my heart. We have all these teenagers. I think he's given me the gifts and the desire to want to do that. And then I'm going to say, I'm not going to go against the Spirit. Let's help you do that. We're going to come around you and we're going to help get that thing going. And we're going to support you. But who knows what that is? It could be fixing cars in a garage for uh, people that have no money. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not calling you out, Todd. I'm saying it could be. Okay. All, right. All right. So, uh, programs versus provision. We take the gifts that God gives us through the Holy Spirit, and then we use those. You know that we have someone that, that works with a lot of broken people all day long during the week? Maybe God's empowering them to work with broken people in some way. You know? Amen? All right. Phase three, mentoring elders. Okay. Uh, at some point this year, as, as you make it clear that you are in this ministry for the long haul, that you fully embrace what we're trying to do, I will be looking for Christians that have matured, okay, that are reading their word, that understand what it means to be holy, that are striving for that, I'm going to be looking for those people to mentor them and develop them into elders 
and deacons in this church, in the Lord's church, because there's only one fellowship. And that doesn't mean that uh, we're going to form a church board or anything. That doesn't mean that you're going to have power and influence and ultimate, <laughs> you know, no. It means that you're going to be an example that the rest of the church looks up to, that you're going to be a mentor, that you're going to be mentoring people actively that are uh, interested in the same types of ministries that you do. Uh, and it means that you are a mature Christian that is, is serving. Uh, and yes, those elders will meet with me periodically and give me advice because we will be uh, unified in mission and purpose and that I need to remain humble when they have something to say because I know that the Holy Spirit can work through them to help me as the pastor. Amen? Amen. So that is what we will be hoping for, that we begin to mentor leaders uh, because I can't do everything on my own. There's only so many hours of the day. Amen? Amen. But if we can start mentoring leaders and developing leadership in this church, we might be ministering five days a week in five different cities, doing five different types of ministry, and impacting hundreds of people, not because of an organization, but just because the Spirit's working through us. All right? Okay, and four. Phase four, towards the end of this next year we should begin to prepare to birth another ministry, a separate ministry. Uh, and what this will look like is as we grow, I hope that the Lord continues to grow us. So we can't take that for granted. He may want us to stay right here, and we have to be content with that. But one thing that I've learned is that wherever the Holy Spirit is, and wherever there's humility and people that are committed uh, to work uh, towards a common goal, those things grow. And as we grow, and as more people come to embrace fellowship with us, we're going to get to a point where we, be, we get too large. I can only effectively minister to about 70 people. Okay? And that would be if I was full time. Right. Okay? Uh, right now I can effectively minister to about 12 people. So some of you I haven't gone over to see this week. Some of you haven't gotten any phone calls from me lately. I try and post on Facebook, which really helps everyone to kind of communicate and people can send me messages. But it is hard to be in a, a bivocational pastor. Okay? Uh, but if we get up to 100 people, the Lord is going to provide someone with the gift of preaching that has the same heart as me that I'm going to be able to mentor for a certain amount of months. And what's going to happen is there might be 20 people that live in Foley that are attending our ministry, and we're going to help birth that into its own separate ministry. That doesn't mean that we won't get together, you know, three times, three, four times a year and have a super awesome worship service together because we're still family. But it means that we, we have to be willing to say goodbye to each other and not worry about the costs of losing the good ones. Amen? Yeah. Right? I mean, we can't be afraid to lose Todd. Because he's a good one, right? Okay? But if God calls Todd to help start something in a different location, we have to be say We have to let him go. God's going to bring new people in both situations. And it's not about money. It's not about power. It's not about control. It's about following the Spirit of the Lord. Okay? God's going to call more people to pastor and lead and shepherd. So that is kind of where I'm looking to take us this year. We're going to continue preparing our hearts, deep theological conversations, deep in the Word. We're going to start, when you're ready, you're going to start coming to me and saying, I feel like I'm ready to start ministering, and we're going to work together to find out what God is calling you to do in your life. Then we're going to go into a mentoring phase uh, and eventually, a healthy church, I feel, is one where there's lots of elders mentoring somebody. Uh, and it's, uh, mentor, uh, eldership is always about mentorship in the scriptures. It was never about being the treasurer and doing this about the building and forming a church board. It was always about being an example towards the rest of the flock. And then for birthing a new fellowship, I know all of you like to see my bright, shiny face. 
some of you may not be here at the end of this year because we're starting something new. doesn't mean that we say goodbye to each other, but it just means that we're helping further the kingdom of God. Amen?